The time has come, so we would now like to begin the presentation. We have sci Chief Scientist of Uber ATG and the head of Uber ATG Toronto, Professor Rackwell Ulstan. We'll be talking about a future with uh, auto autonomous driving. Uh, she will be uh, making her presentation online. Please. Hi, everyone. My name is Raquel Urtasen, and I'm the chief scientist at Uber ATG, as well as a professor at the University of Toronto. In this talk, I'm going to talk about how Uber ATG is pioneering in building the next generation self-driving technology that will allow us to deploy safely at scale. Four different things are required in order to accomplish self-driving at scale. The ability to build vehicles at scale. The ability to operate fleets of cars. Building the brain of the self-driving car such, a, such that it generalizes to many places in the world where Uber already operates today. The network platform as well. The car ownership model, as you see today, will drastically change with self-driving. Instead, you will get your self-driving car as a service, which you will call with a push of a button in your app. This will be a seamless experience where you can um, combine several ways of transportation, bikes, the train station, for example, with your self-driving car. At Uber ETG, we don't build cars, but we have partnered with some of the best and largest vehicle manufacturers, such as Toyota and Volvo, to do so. We develop the brain in-house, and we definitely know how to build a network. We are planning to work on both internally and externally developed technology. So you will see many different self-driving cars on the Uber network. Having the Uber network is fantastic. It means that we don't need to solve all the difficult cases from the start such as winter in Sapporo, before uh, safely deploying this technology. Instead, we will have a hybrid network where some rides will be served by self-driving cars, some by human-driven ones. Now, let me tell you how a self-driving car works. The traditional software stack employed by most competitors is composed of a set of modules executed one after another. Every fraction of a second, the vehicle senses the environment this is illustrated here with a bird's eye view of the LiDAR point clouds. The first task is then to localize the vehicle with precision of a few centimeters. This is done not only to route the vehicle to the desired destination, but also to utilize high definition maps as prior knowledge for subsequent tasks. The perception system is then responsible for estimating where the objects are in the scene. Here depicted with rectangles for vehicles and circles for pedestrians. The prediction system then takes the output of perception and estimates the potential trajectories that the actors might do in the next few seconds. Then the motion planning module focuses on a region around the said driving car and estimates the safest maneuver towards the goal that the vehicle should do in the next few seconds. The control system then ensures that the trajectory we intended to follow is the one that is executed as there might be deviations due to unaccounted factors such as friction and simplistic vehicle dynamics. This full process is then repeated every fraction of a second, typically 100 milliseconds. The advantage of this popular paradigm lies in the fact that we have interpretable intermediate representations and it is easy to incorporate prior knowledge. However, reaction time is typically large as computation adds up. Furthermore, Developer productivity is very low, as any changes done in one part of the stack will affect the entire stack, and engineers need to manually adjust their algorithms to account for those changes. Furthermore, the different models are not trained for the end task, and thus improvements in model performance do not translate to better driving. Our vision at Uber ATG, which is different from any other competitor, has the advantages of both modern AI and traditional engineering approaches but without inheriting their respective drawbacks. In particular, we believe in having a single AI system that can automatically adjust itself to any changes that's increasing significantly the developer productivity. As computation is, not shared across is now shared across models, the resulting reaction time is also much lower, resulting in safety, safer driving. Furthermore, we produce interpretable intermediate representations and allow for the incorporation of prior knowledge. For example, to guarantee that we follow the rules of traffic. Unlike existing approaches, our AI system does not 
thus complex reasoning, resulting in much better motion plans. Finally, since our approach is trained for the end task, every improvement in the model results in better driving. One of the most difficult parts of self-driving is to be able to predict the behavior of humans. This is the case as many possibilities exist, for example, turning or continuing straight at an intersection. And humans don't always follow the rules. To address this, our models predict multimodal probability distributions over the future locations of each actor. In the video, I'm displaying the output of our motion forecasting system on difficult scenarios. Green boxes represent the estimated location of vehicles and yellow circles represent pedestrians. You can see our multimodal predictions of where the actors might go in the next few seconds. Note that the system is able to reason about all these many actors in only a fraction of a second. Modern perception and motion forecasting algorithms still have difficulties with heavy occluded or faraway actors due to these past sensor observations. Failing to detect and predict the intention of these hard-to-see actors might have catastrophic consequences in safety-critical situations. Another really cool piece of technology we have developed is B2Bnet, the first sophisticated AI-based vehicle-to-vehicle communication approach for self-driving. It is designed to achieve the best compromise of perception and prediction performance, while also satisfying existing hardware transmission bandwidth capabilities. In particular, we send intermediate representations of each vehicle's autonomy neural network. Then a specially aware graph neural network aggregates the information perceived from nearby vehicles. Our experiments show that we can reduce perception errors uh, by 70% uh, with this vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, technology. Let's go back to our novel approach to autonomy. We have built seven generations of interpretable neural motion planners. In this video, you can see our first generation, where a single model detects objects in the scene, predicts their future motion, as well as the, uh, predicts the cost volume of a sample-based motion planner. As you can see, the cost volume, which is here depicted uh, with uh, uh, this colorful um, um, landscape, um, is able to uh, have multimodal distributions of all the possibilities that the self-driving car can do. And it's able to handle things like understand rules of traffic, including traffic lights, and produce a smooth and safe driving. Key to developing is the uh, key to developing self driving is the, uh, is the availability of high definition maps. These are, however, very expensive to generate and maintain. It was estimated by a third party that just yes, building the maps of the US uh, once will take uh, will cost approximately one billion dollars. We have built a state-of-the-art technology that can map online all the lanes as we drive. This technology allows us to drive hundreds of kilometers on highways without intervention and without requiring a map a priori. We see this as the fail-safe system in the rare event that the map is not up to date or localization fails. But the world is even more complex. In Toronto, we say that there are two seasons, winter and construction. In the video, you can see how our, our sophisticated gradient networks with memory can map online complex constructions. And our vehicles can act accordingly once we actually perceive these construction sites. Simulation is very important to both test the safety of cell driving as well as to create additional training data at little cost. Recall the cell driving stack, which was composed of perception, prediction, and motion planning. Existing approaches for simulation in industry mostly test motion planning by uh, generating scenarios that are composed of ground truth bounding boxes and trajectories. This is problematic as this does not test the full system and the results overestimate the performance of the autonomous system as the simulations do not model the noise and uncertainty of perception and prediction. In order to properly test the autonomous system, we need to have a closed loop simulator that can also simulate how the sensors, such as LADAR and cameras, will see the scene. Existing approaches to sensor simulation utilize virtual worlds created by artists. However, this approach is very costly and does not scale. 
Furthermore, there is a large fidelity gap between the real world and the simulations. Thus, we cannot test with confidence with this traditional approach that our competitors are using. Our approach is different. Instead of using artists to generate a virtual world, we reconstruct the world automatically from data captured by our self-driving cars. This approach scales much better as we can reconstruct every location we have driven, and we have driven now more than 3 million miles. Furthermore, it has a much higher degree of fidelity, allowing us to properly test our system. As you can see here, we can reconstruct the static background really well. This is one particular street of Pittsburgh, which is one of the locations where we operate. As well as the dynamic assets at scale, uh, we can construct tens of thousands of these assets automatically. Importantly, since our assets come from the real world, we have a high degree of diversity, as you can see here, with many different shapes as well as poses for these uh, actors. As you can see in the video, the green boxes uh, are produced by um, using perception um, on top of our simulation, while on the right-hand side is perception on the real LIDAR data. Now, by looking at the output of perception, which is these green boxes, you can see that uh, in both cases, it performs exactly the same way. This is the reason why we don't have fidelity gap and we can basically test our systems this way. We can use this technology to generate safety critical scenarios by reconstructing the world we have seen and composite it to generate new scenes. On the right hand side, you can see our LIDAR simulator that has near zero fidelity with the real world. And as you can see here, we are generating a safety critical scenario where a car is just coming out of occlusion and our vehicle has to react to it. Note that none of these uh, scenarios actually did happen in practice. This is something that we are creating on our simulators. Importantly, we can create these simulations at scale, uh, meaning that uh, we can actually create them in all the different uh, locations uh, uh, in all the different locations where we operate, and at the same time, we can create uh, variations of the particular scenario to test. The same fidelity can be applied to video simulation, where we can enhance existing logs captured by our vehicles by inserting and removing um, uh, objects. Importantly, these objects are consistent over time and are three-dimensional allowing us to simulate multi multiple cameras in the same vehicle, as well as multiple sensors in a consistent manner. This is really the technology that enables to safely test uh, you know, safety critical situations. Now, what separates Uber ATG from other companies is the investment on AI research as the solution to self driving at the scale does not exist yet. And AI breakthroughs are necessary. Furthermore, we have made all this technology available to the public by publishing all our latest, greatest AI algorithms, such as together we can solve self-driving and change the way we live. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Otosand, for the presentation. Uh, we have a few questions uh, from uh, the, uh, the audience who were very uh, interested to uh, hear that you'll be presenting at ISAM. Uh, so um, may I please ask you a few questions now on their behalf? Um, so COVID-19 has had a negative impact on R&D in autonomous cars, uh, sorry, um, has, has um, COVID-19 had any impact on, um, on autonomous car R&D uh, because uh, it is uh, making it difficult for um, governments to fund POC, etc. or do you think it's creating new opportunities? Um, we'd like to hear your current view on the future, uh, on the current state and the future outlook in North America for um, R&D in autonomous vehicles. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think, you know, COVID-19 has introduced many challenges to every industry, right, including self-driving. Uh, my team in Toronto is especially uh, close-knit. So working remotely has made uh, you know, our difficult mission of solving self-driving even more challenging. Uh, but everybody's up for the, for the challenge. Now, um, so in a sense, uh, also the fact that we rely a lot on simulation 
as well as our test, test track testing, instead of relying on just driving on the, on the real world, um, has made that the impact, uh, the impact of COVID-19 to be uh, much smaller than otherwise would have been. So in that sense, we have continued to develop our technology and advance uh, very nicely within you know, the past uh, months during the pandemic. Thank you very much. So uh, you, you have shown a lot of simulations, so you're pushing on with your uh, research and development activity in this area. Good. And uh, the future of mobility, which uh, is about optimizing um, and um, uh, and providing mobility, not just um, uh, having cars uh, physically. Um, uh, I, so in order to create such uh, self-driving, um, uh, uh, a mobility system based on self-driving, um, you will probably would need to involve multiple uh, stakeholders in this, um, gov local authorities, governments, uh, auto manufacturers, could you tell us a little bit about um, how you go about developing this kind of community consortium to uh, move on with uh, Uber's vision on the future of mobility? Uh, sure, so our approach has always been, uh, for example, to involve uh, a close partnership with OEMs. Um, so this is why we have partnered uh, closely with uh, Volvo as well as uh, Toyota. Um, uh, to build the, uh, the future generation of self-driving vehicles. Uh, because at the, at the end of the day, if you think of Uber, we are not in the business of building cars uh, from the ground up. And uh, instead, you know, we want to partner with uh, companies that have been building this technology for, you know, tens, uh, tens uh, um, you know, for many, many years, for many decades. Um, and... Um, also, with respect to uh, uh, governments, uh, so we work closely with uh, with governments and uh, uh, policymakers, uh, etc. Right, in order to uh, you know design what will be the way to uh, uh, put this technology in practice safely in, on our roads. So definitely, uh, you know, a company does not or Uber does not develop everything in isolation, but is really, uh, you know, with a consortium of different partners, uh, you know, towards, as I said, building uh, safely uh, technology for also safe deployment at scale. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, for uh, the future that you envision about uh, providing a mobility um, inclusion for the elderly and people in need for uh, driving, uh, it, uh, the, uh, this has to become more affordable and, um, and more accessible to the wider public. Uh, so um, uh, do, when, around when do you think we will be reaching that stage when this uh, will be available at, um, uh, at an affordable uh, level? And do you think at that time, um, how, how do you think um, it will coexist with existing um, public transport services? And, mm -hmm. uh, and finally, you're based in, in Toronto City. So um, how, what sort of vision did Toronto City have in attracting Uber ATG in, in building this kind of future? Thank you. Uh, so thanks, thanks for the question. I guess the, the many questions in one. Um, so, uh, so with respect to uh, affordability and then bring this technology for everybody, this is something that definitely Uber cares about, right? To build a product where, you know, everybody can benefit from at, at prices that are affordable. Now, in terms of you know, timelines on when this technology will be available at the scale, it's a great question and it's a question that I often get. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, yeah, as, uh, and it's important to know that you know, at Uber, we are not chasing you know, a date for uh, releasing our technology. Um, instead, uh, we are uh, you know, we are uh, taking the problem of self-driving and breaking it down. And in particular, you know, one of the advantages um, um, of uh, working at Uber is the fact that we have the Uber ecosystem, meaning that we can develop technology um, that and start, you know, deploying safely in certain areas where it's actually easier to uh, do self-driving. Um, and then uh, utilize a hybrid network of human drivers as well as 
uh, self-driving cars to serve the entire population, right? And then little by little grow where the self-driving network actually operates with respect to the human-driven network. In terms of the, your question with respect to, um, I'm sorry, this is a, actually a, something very, very uh, exciting and it will allow us to deploy technology earlier than if you have to solve all the possible situations or all the possible locations, for example, uh, Sapporo during the winter, right? That's a difficult, difficult area to, to drive. Um, now, with respect to your question about public transportation, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we envision self-driving to work in harmony, in coordination with uh, public transit. And you can think of the Uber network as multimodal and where you can utilize a combination of, you take public transit, for example, to go the longer distance, and then for the last mile, you can pick up your self-driving car, you can pick up, you know, a self-driving car can pick you up. Um, so th we definitely uh, envision this as a way to augment transportation, mm. not, not as a way to remove, uh, you know, great ways of transportation such as public transit. Yeah, uh, so it's very much working complementary to, yes, That's right. and, and That's right. um, bringing uh, op optimization of the whole transport system. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and you know, it opens really the ability to go this last mile that is actually really difficult for public transit. Mm -hmm. So in that mm -hmm. sense, right, they go really nicely together. Yeah, and, and you're working with Toronto City in, uh, in kind of building that kind uh, that partnership between existing transport system and uh, self-drive vehicles. Yeah, so, so I guess we, we work, uh, you know, in, in coordination with, with many cities, not just the city uh, of, of yes. Toronto. Now, uh, with respect to your question of, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the vision and, and attracting Uber ATG, so the main uh, attractor for Uber ATG was actually the talent the talent in AI, mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, which I guess is the the, uh, the topic of this conference. Um, and you know, as you know, a lot of the breakthroughs in AI were done in Canada and in Toronto in particular, right? And that was the reason why you know the landscape of uh, opening a, a lab dedicated to R&D in Toronto made a lot of sense for Uber, and it was the first international lab that uh, you know we had. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you very much for uh, making that point. On Channel B for the viewers uh, from 9.30, actually, there will be some of the um, uh, AI talent uh, spinning out from that area who've set up uh, startups to present on their technology. So it's, um, very, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Otasan, for kind of set, setting uh, a, a good start of the day in bringing such a very uh, fut uh, futuristic, but accessible, reachable vision of the transport. Um, thank you very much for joining us. So from My pleasure. questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, addressing them. Thank you. Dr. Ota-san, thank you very much.